Welcome to Catholic Conversations. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. And today I'm going to be talking about politics from a Thomistic perspective. You know, we talk about politics all the time and people just argue over how things should work. And we kind of just miss the whole point and say, and we don't go back to the first principles and say, what exactly is politics for? What is government for? And right now among in America, we have a lot of turmoil and people saying things like, Okay, well, you know, clearly the American system is not working the way that we thought it would or the way we would like it to. So now people are, are, are proposing alternative forms of government, talking about things like, okay, what about fascism? What about uh, monarchy? What about uh, socialism? What about communism? When all these different political philosophies are coming up and we're trying to deal with them. And we're trying to figure out what is good, what is bad, what can we take, what can, what should we get rid of? And so today I'm going to be going over a Thomistic view of the of political philosophy with Father Crean from the uh, English province of the Dominican Friars. Good morning to you, to everybody. Uh, good morning to you, Father Crean. Good morning. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, perfectly. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Then, Father, uh, could you introduce yourself a little bit? I, we, uh, why is it that uh, the that you are interested in this topic? You wrote a book on integralism, and hopefully, we'll get to talk about that a little bit. I want to start with uh, first principles, and then maybe we can get into uh, more particular things uh, later on. But uh, what got you interested in this topic in particular? Well, I think the first thing that got me interested was that I was teaching a course on political philosophy and I thought it would be useful to have a a book that would set out the the key principles of political philosophy from a, a Catholic perspective and I didn't know of one that was doing that in a way that I thought was full enough and so with uh, a friend of mine called Alan Fimister we decided to get together and try and write such a book. Hmm. So that's how we came to publish this book called Integralism uh, about two years ago. So that, that was the immediate um, motivation. And uh, a, a motivation of longer standing was that I've been interested for quite a long time in the whole question of, of religious liberty, what, what that means for a Catholic point of view and how it's compatible with uh, the church's traditional understanding of the uh, the rights of our Lord to reign over society and the, the duties of of politicians to um, help the mission of the church. Uh, and so that question was one of the key ones that we were that we were tackling in the book. Wonderful. Um, the another thing that I have a uh, what I've noticed about whenever people start talking about these things and I've noticed whenever I started reading St. Thomas and what he had to say about this topic is he started off by saying, OK, well, the the point of politics is actually something that goes beyond the just finding a practical solution to common day issues. It goes beyond that and it goes more towards the the same principles that uh, that that individual man has. So every man is directed toward God, right? And so the government should also be, in a sense, directed toward God. Could you speak about what exactly is politics for and what is government for, I guess, was in the same vein? Yes, a, a good question goes straight to the heart of the, the great divide, I would say. Um, and I think the great divide today um, is between those who think that there is uh, an objective good for human beings uh, to which we are uh, partly directed by nature and partly called by God um, uh, and therefore people who, who think like this think that um, our life together in society should be um framed with that good in mind so that the the laws the institutions of that of the society make it easier for us to obtain that good end for which we were made so that's 
what I would say is the not just the Thomistic view, but just the Catholic view. Uh, and then there's the view that's come to be called liberalism, which is the opposite of that, which either says um, th there's no such thing as an objective good or that we can't know what it is or that we even if we could know, um, we're not allowed to make use of it uh, in the way we frame our laws um, and institutions. Uh, and that, um, so these, these people would say it's wrong uh, for those in authority in society to try to promote uh, one vision of the purpose of human life. They should just uh, create a kind of neutral space where um, the competing visions can fight it out. That's interesting, Father, because, you know, I was the in preparation for our interview, I'll just uh, let people know I was reading this book published by Norton Critical. Uh, it's translated and edited by Paul Sigmund. It's St. Thomas Aquinas on politics and ethics. And as I'm reading it, I noticed that St. Thomas, he was saying that the if your society has a perverted idea of the ultimate end of man, then that will be reflected in your rulers. So he says, if the ultimate end of man in society was life and health of body, then doctors would rule. And I'm thinking immediately I'm struck <laughs> by, I'm like, okay, that kind of sounds familiar of what we had the last <laughs> couple of years. I won't mention details uh, for obvious reasons. But, and then they, he goes on and said, but and if wealth is your highest good, then bankers, or he uses the word stewards, would be the person, people that are in charge of running your, your country and so on and so forth. And so... It kind of makes me think that the idea that we we kind of get the rulers that we deserve. So what comes first in a society? Uh, is it the the people or is it God? And whenever I talk about this, because I end up having discussions with people about monarchy, one thing that people often will bring up in opposition to monarchy is the idea that, okay, well, you know, the the Jews, before they had David, they had or they before they had Saul, they had the they were spoke directly with God and God was their king. And then the and then they got corrupted by having an actual king. So what exactly comes first in a society? Is it the populace? Is it the polis? Or is it the actually the, the government? How how does it how do you get from having people to having a form of government and then a particular form of government? Well, there's a lot of different questions there. Um, if you're asking about a sort of hypothetical um, scenario in which, uh, say, there's been some kind of massive disaster in a nuclear holocaust or something like that, and you've just got a few uh, scattered families, uh, then you could say in, in, that, in those extreme circumstances, um, th those households or heads of those households would have the right and in fact the duty to to get together and decide on some kind of uh, form of society for themselves um, but that's obviously a, a hypothetical uh, situation that thankfully is not being <laughs> realized <Right>. anywhere uh, <laughs> in the world today as far as I know um, but in another sense uh, society um, comes first uh, in, in this sense that there's a, a popular idea in political philosophy that's been around for a few hundred years, which is that human beings uh, are not um, born with any kinds of any kind of obligations to authority or to the, the state or to the country, but that they just contract in uh, either consciously or in some kind of uh, implicit way. This is what's called the social contract associated with people like uh, Hobbes in England and uh, Rousseau in France. But that's not the Catholic view. The Catholic view is that God has made us um, social beings uh, from the beginning. Um, we, we, have, um, we have duties to whoever is in the seat of authority in our society simply from the fact of, of being born. Uh, 
and if it's a if it's a democratic society then that means we've got the right to uh, propose uh, alternative rulers uh, alternative politicians to be in charge uh, if it's not a democratic society if we're born into an absolute monarchy then that's that's what we should recognize as as having the authority from god in, in that society uh, but what we don't have the right to is just to uh, uh just to try to abolish mm. uh authority altogether because that would be going against the natural order of things going against the natural law so i guess that leads into a great question on legitimate forms of government so people i mean america <laughs> is famously uh, founded on revolution and then but you know catholics being a, being a catholic you know we don't want to be revolutionaries in fact we want to be counter revolutionaries but at the same time as an american we have in our history that spirit of revolution that uh founding of revolution and even in our in our founding documents instead of instead of um ingraining we have ingrained rights to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness which in in the language that's laid out there it says okay well if that's the end to which we direct our lives and that then our rulers will reflect that so what are the let me just i'll come back to some of those other points later the question i have for you right now is what are the legitimate forms of governments well legitimate forms of government are, are very varied I mean, the only basic requirement is that the the people in, in power should intend the the genuine good of those uh, over whom they have some kind of authority uh, but that's as that's really as specific as it gets so um, a monarchy is a is a is a legitimate form of government whether that's hereditary monarchy or elected monarchy uh, or a, a, a pure democracy where everything is run as far as possible by by um, referenda that would be uh, legitimate or a society where a certain class of people um, are eligible for election uh, in itself that's that's one possible way of of, of running your country um, now i think there's a, a reason to have a preference for you know other things being equal for as much uh popular participation as can as can be managed i think that's consonant with human nature and also tends to the uh, tranquility of of a society but there's, cer there's certainly no kind of natural right to to choose your to choose your rulers to choose your your uh, your politicians um so i was reading rereading recently um a passage in in the acts of the apostles where saint paul is um brought before the, the governor in caesarea and it's very striking how he recognizes the right of the emperor uh to try cases and clearly the emperor had not been chosen by any kind of um, mass suffrage and in fact he wasn't even a uh, a good person he was the emperor nero at the time was one of the most uh, corrupt people who's ever lived but um he is uh following out his own his own doctrine that he sets forth in in romans 13 about the powers that be uh being ordained by god and therefore we have a duty to submit to them now i don't know if i would say that that means that every form of every concretely existing form of government is is legitimate because to claim that something is legitimate is will be to claim that it's um completely in order and part of uh the catholic understanding of politics and what we're getting at in the book is that a society and its rulers are not in order uh unless they submit themselves to christ but nevertheless even if they may not be legitimate in the full sense we can still have a duty to uh, obey them provided they don't tell us to do anything immoral hmm. in that case would you say that uh the communist governments are in a sense legitimate and because uh, i would my instincts would say you know communism would not be legitimate form of government and the people would have a right to rebel but 
the if if it's case that if they is communism in any way a legitimate government? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, what what we what what they would say, what I would say, and I think this is consonant with with um, Catholic doctrine and opinion of of theologians uh, is that uh, when you if you get to the point of of uh, rulers who are uh, violating the natural law in a systematic and grave manner, then you're kind of then you're kind of in a situation where where just war criteria apply because in fact the the government there is is waging war on its on its own uh, putative citizens. Hmm. Uh, for example, if it is trying to take all the property away of its citizens and you know, uh, put them into camps and just give them uh, minimum soup rations to keep them alive, then well, that's a uh, a grave violation um, of of uh, natural law which they are uh, trying to effect. And so it seems to me, and this is also the um, the point of view of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, as published by Pope John Paul II, that in those circumstances, just war criteria would apply. So if there was a, a well-founded hope of being able to effect a change for the better, then in those extreme circumstances, uh, um, the populace could, uh, I wouldn't use the word uh, re uh, revolt. Uh, I wouldn't say it was a revolution. I would say that was a counter-revolution and that it was actually the uh the restoration of charge order. who were the uh, who were who were the true revolutionaries who right. just needed to be dealt with no that makes sense yes because the, the the country that was communist would have once been ordered and so it's a restoration of order uh not a revolution a counter-revolution that makes sense the so that makes me uh there's man there's so many questions that could come from this uh, politics it's i i should have thought more about a, a good pathway on this conversation because I have about a dozen different things that I want to ask you. The So going along with the same idea of a legitimate form of government, I was surprised to see St. Thomas, he talks about that the that tyranny does not come solely from monarchy because I was thinking about as you were talking about communism being a actually a form of tyranny. But communism is clearly not a monarchy, and so people's first reaction against monarchy is, well, if you have a bad monarch, you have a tyrant, a, a tyrant, and then it's, it becomes a tyranny. But St. Thomas argues that all the different forms of governments, their corruption ultimately ends up becoming a tyranny, and some person will end up taking control, and that person will end up becoming the tyrant. And I get a modern example would be, you know, we have these communist states that claim to have, a, oh, okay, we're going to have a group of people, we're going to have things in in community. Uh, it's going to be rule of the of the of the populace, and instead, it ends up becoming a tyranny where you have Stalin or you have Mao and things like that. So, I suppose my my question is the is a question of what is a tyranny and when is uh when does a government become go from a legitimate form of government to a tyranny well the classic um idea of what the tyrant is really goes back to the ancient greeks um and they they tended to um have this schema where the the city state will be typically governed either by one man or by a, an elite class or by the people as a whole, in fact, the free men as a whole. Um, and they recognize that for each of these three paradigms, um, those with the power could either intend the good of the city or um, they could intend their own private good. Uh, and the word tyranny was used or was used by uh, by Aristotle to uh, refer to the situation where where there's essentially one person with supreme power and he's using his power for the uh, his own good. Um, but in a broader sense, you could use the word tyranny for for any any form of government, whether it's um, uh, supposedly democratic or whether it's supposedly um, the rule of a few or supposedly the rule of one rule of one. Uh, 
uh, for any form of government where the, the ruling element is intending its own its own good. Um, and St. Thomas makes uh, uh, an interesting remark in that, um, uh, that passage I think you're referring to, uh, where he says that uh, in itself, it might look like the worst, uh, it might look like kingship or the rule of one person if it becomes corrupted by that one person desiring his own private good, that, that look, might look, be, look like the worst possible case. But uh, he actually says that, that that's true in the abstract, it's very unlikely um, that one person uh, would always be acting tyrannically, be unlikely that he wouldn't sometimes be doing some things uh, for the good of his own, for the good of his country. Um, just because it's quite hard to be that selfish, uh, <laughs> that determinedly selfish all the time. Whereas if you've got a sort of oligarchy in charge, um, it's quite likely that at any given point, uh, some members of that oligarchy will be pursuing selfish policies. So he actually thought it would, in practice, uh, tyranny tended to be worse when there was a, an oligarchy in charge rather than when there was a, a monarch in charge. Yeah, I thought that was very interesting. I had never considered that, and I was I found that very fascinating. the The other thing that I found fascinating that I just I, that kind of blew my mind because I had heard people talk about this before, but they kind of they were talking about that you know uh, the St. Thomas talks about three legitimate forms of government that are good that are ideal. You have an aristocracy, you have a monarchy, and then they would also say a democracy. But St. Thomas. When I was reading it, he seems to use language, and I obviously I didn't look at the at what he uses in Latin, but he seems to say a polity is good and a democracy is a corruption of a polity. So what are the terms that he's using there? What, what does he mean by a polity and what does he mean by a democracy when he says democracy is a corruption of a polity? Yeah, um, well, he is, that's going back to the, the original distinctions drawn by Aristotle in, um, in Greek. Um, so the word polity in its origin is really just a general term for any kind of organization of society. Um, but in Aristotle, it comes to be used also in a more special sense, uh, namely where the ruling element um, is, is a large number of people, um, essentially all, all the free members of society which would have meant for aristotle would have meant uh not not slaves and not women uh, and not children obviously uh and and when that when that was working well aristotle called that a timocracy uh and he reserved the word the greek word democracy um for that same arrangement but when it was working badly mm -hmm. uh, in, in particular when when the um the mass of people uh, massive free men uh, turned against the rich and made the lives of the rich miserable. Uh, so, so when Aristotle or Saint Thomas says that democracy is a corruption, uh, you don't want to read too much into that. They're using the word democracy in a not to mean representative government mm. uh, in general. In fact, Aristotle didn't really have representative government at all because he just voted personally on in the marketplace. Uh, that they're using the word democracy there to mean uh, the state of affairs where the um, the ruling element is a mass of people and the mass of people are using that power to punish the rich. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And also, I mean, even the American government is not really a democracy. It's a democratic republic at best or a, a representative government. So the so it's a slightly different in its understanding. I didn't realize that was an interesting uh, little historical note. Did not know that. The other thing about this situation is the role of the church in government. And so whenever people think, whenever people hear the term integralism, and then also when they hear the term distributism, more people have heard the term distributism, I think, um, than integralism because of G.K. Chesterton and Hilar Belloc. Um, but the uh, first, could you define those terms? And secondly, what is the role of the church with the with the state or with the government right so 
Um, yeah, so you mentioned monarchy a moment ago. Um, so I would start from the point of view that, that there is a is one monarch uh, who uh, certainly has a full authority, uh, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And in the, um, in the book of the Apocalypse, the last book of the Bible, St. John has this great vision of, of our Lord seated upon the white horse um, and with the words King of Kings and Lord of Lords um, engraved upon his thigh. So that is really the first principle of, of what's come to be called integralism, where I would just say another word for integralism is a phrase for integralism is is the principles behind Christendom. So that Christ is not just my personal Lord and Savior, though he certainly is that, um, but he's also the king over families and over societies. This is what's sometimes called the social kingship of Christ. So integralism means the doctrine that um, that people should recognize that, in particular, that, that politicians, that statesmen, those in power, whether they be kings or presidents or prime ministers or whatever, that they should recognize that they are subject to Jesus Christ uh, and not just in their private lives, but in their public uh, acts as well, that they are, will be answerable indeed to Christ for the way they use their power. Uh, and that their the highest uh, duty and the highest privilege is uh, within the the limits of their circumstances. We can come on to that maybe a little bit later. To use their authority to to promote the the glory of God, the, the kingship of Christ on earth, uh, and the salvation of souls. Because um, we we talked at the beginning about uh, the end for which human beings are created. Uh, and in a sense, we've got a, a double end. We've got an end uh, on this earth, how we should live on this earth, but uh, and an end in eternity. But ultimately, we've only got one final end by definition, uh, which is eternity, which is beatitude. Uh, and unless everything that's happening, everything that we're freely doing on earth is in some way directed towards that, that true end of beatitude, then it's a waste of time at best and uh, harmful at worst. Um, so integra integralism means that those who have got the faith, those who've got the Catholic faith and know why they're here on earth, when they, if they're in positions of authority as lawgivers or as um, uh, policy makers, uh, they can and, and should make use of that, that knowledge, that knowledge they have of the purpose of life um, without violating the consciences of others, uh, but without pretending that they don't really know what life is all about. Mm. So would it be... Uh, so, yeah, so that's uh, would... something about integralism. Do you want me to also to go on to uh, distributism? Uh, yes, would you like to, real uh, quickly, I'd like to try to summarize that and let me know if I'm understanding correctly. It, would it be correct to say integralism is more a principle than a form of government, and that principle is to put the first things first uh, and whenever you're making decisions about uh, policies and the way you run a government? Yeah, I think that's quite a good way of putting it. It's not, it's not a specific form of government, like is it a monarchy or is it a combination of monarchy and democracy? All the, those things are kind of neutral questions. It, it can be... a a right answer in particular circumstances, but in uh, in, a, in the abstract, all those forms of, of government are possible. So yes, I, I agree that integralism is about putting first things first. Okay, and then uh, could you go on to distributism about that? Because now, okay, that makes more sense. So now distributism, to me, the I've always been kind of like, mm, whenever I hear distributism, because whenever I hear it explained to me, and this is probably just a deficiency in myself and my own intelligence. But whenever it's explained to me, I just it just sounds like a, a socialism with a Catholic veneer to it. And that's just what it sounds like to me. But I recognize G.K. Chesterton was a fan of it. Hiller Belloc was a fan of it. 
and uh, those are both faithful Catholics. So there's probably a deficiency in myself rather than in distributism. So what what is distributism? Yes, it was very different from from socialism. Um, I mean, socialism is really the doctrine that the state, so the government, uh, is the the true owner of of everything, and that um, if human beings or families or corporations are allowed to own anything, it's really only on sufferance uh, on on the from the, on the state's part. Um, so that's definitely not. Um, that's definitely not um, uh, Catholic uh, to think like that. Um, so as, as Leo the Thirteenth, Pope Leo the uh, Thirteenth, explains in one of his uh, great encyclicals, the the family uh, is prior to the state and has uh, has rights that um, that precede it and that are uh, irrefragable. Uh, and uh, one of those is the ownership of property. Um, so I would say distributism is is a golden mean between uh, socialism on the one hand uh, and uh, well certainly unfettered capitalism on the other. So um, it's it's a doctrine that private property should be uh, owned in significant amounts by a large uh, portion of the uh, population that as many households as possible should have some ownership of the means of production rather than uh, working for a wage for a small number of employers. So, so you've got the two extremes. One is socialism, where basically there's only one employer, the state, ultimately, even if they... Um, allow on sufferance uh, some people to to have uh, bank accounts and uh, and their own apparent private property but it can be recorded at any time by the state so that's one extreme the other extreme is when you've got a, a few number a small number of extremely wealthy people but the mass of the mass of the population uh, working for them for a wage rather than uh, having some uh, ownership themselves of, of the means of production. Uh, so uh, the reason why uh, people like Chesterton and um, various popes like Pius XI, Leo XIII, um, have, uh, have recommended what's come to be called distributism, well, I think it's partly because uh, it's more consonant to human uh, dignity of human nature to be a, a self mover, that's to say, to have one's own resources rather than to be working as a servant of another, uh, as is the case of those who are working for a wage. Uh, and I would say it's also because uh, it provides a bulwark against, uh, against tyranny. Uh, so that brings us back to the the, the previous um, uh, the previous discussion uh, you know, if you have a small number of very rich people it's very easy for them to manipulate public opinion uh, as we see today um, and and since wealth uh, is corruptive intrinsically corruptive of those who have it and you have to fight against that tendency to become corrupted by your wealth uh, and most people alas don't fight very hard uh, <laughs> because wealth is corruptive if you've got a great deal of wealth then not only will you manipulate public opinion or tend to, you will also tend to manip manipulate it in a bad way. Uh, so that's uh, another reason why um, uh, why I think distributism uh, is a good um, is a good goal to aim for. So then the question becomes a more practical one. In the situation we have, I know every country is different. I'm not from super familiar with the situation and politics is in England. I kind of have an idea the a seemingly a monarchy that doesn't exactly have any power. Maybe they do. I, I um, it's just kind of the uh, the perception from Americans that the monarchy in England doesn't have any power. The it's kind of a, more of an oligarchical rule rather than anything else. 
But in America, as a democratic republic or any number of different governments, how do we move from the imperfect to a more perfect form of government and in a given situation? And I suppose that would be, okay, well, you could have your, you just leave the government as it is and then implement integralistic principles. Um, but what, what are your thoughts on forming a government or reforming a government? Yes, yeah, so I don't think there's uh, a great need um, yeah, in, in my country for for changing the the the, ex the forms of government or changing the um, the combination which we have of of, of monarchy and representative uh, democracy and um, uh, also an uh, unelected and partly hereditary upper chamber. Um, but in a way, those, those are questions which anyone is free to free to disagree about. And they're, they're not the questions on which um, the magisterium of the church uh, pronounces. Um, but what is what is um, true? What is key is this this kingship of Christ, the social kingship of Christ, um, and. So the question you're already asking me, I think, is how um, how is that to be implemented? Uh, and the obvious answer is that, well, you can't implement uh, a social kingship of Christ unless you've got enough Christians uh, to do so. Um, so in a in a society such as ours, where uh, you have elected lawgivers. Um, now, we, we can you know, discuss the. Uh, the existence of, of uh, unelected oligarch oligarchies as well, but we do have nevertheless elected lawgivers, then the only thing to do is to try to uh, uh, elect um, Catholics who are convinced of the truth of the Catholic faith. Uh, and in order to have enough those to elect and who are also you know, personally suitable to, to uh, enter politics, then you need to uh, evangelize and you need to catechize so it's just doing the uh the church doing the basic things that the church should be doing and when the church does those things well when when priests and parents do their duties then the church grows and gets stronger and then you know, over a period of time you have a, a you know more hope of uh electing suitable people but but there's not a uh there's not a uh a policy that you could implement at the next election uh, right. to turn uh, your country from what it is at the moment into a um, into a, uh, a province of Christendom. It's um, right, but what does that look it's like got, exactly? It's got, to come, it's got to begin a conversion of country it has to begin by the conversion of, of individual peoples. Right, absolutely, and I think that's uh, always primary. I think that's probably another reason why. A monarchy is probably the easiest to become Catholic because you only have to convert one person to try to get the ball rolling. Whereas if you have a state like ours, you have to convert everyone. And if they convert, then they have to make sure the next election doesn't put in the, the people that have not been converted. Um, but the the question that I have is, if you do have that situation, let's say, for instance, in America, we have, um, I'm thinking of Ron DeSantis in Florida. He is a Catholic. He seems to be, as far as we are aware, the a seems to be a faithful Catholic. If we were to elect him as president, what would be the actions that he could do that would not that would be Catholic, but also not violate the I want to say the rights of other people. I'm, I'm struggling with the word rights as well because you know rights rights and duties these kind of these kind of words kind of have uh, lost a lot of its meaning but what is it what is it what does a catholic country look like do they tolerate other religions do you, does the church run the country does the does the pope there's memes going around of like joe biden secretly he's uh reporting directly to pope francis um things like that and that was a the thing against jfk when he was running for president that he's going to be controlled by the pope uh, so what what exactly does a catholic president or a catholic king or a catholic government what does that look like exactly yeah i mean that's a, that's the key question um, um in a way it's it depends on where, where you're starting from um 
so for example in, uh, in the in the United States uh, of America um, you have a um, you have a, a constitution which forbids the um, uh, the establishment of a, of a particular religion or on a national level uh, if I'm correct there's nothing forbidding uh, individual states uh, from establishing their own their own constitution so if you had a, a convinced Catholic who was president well he would have to follow the law he couldn't just um, um, uh, say okay I'm, I'm Catholic and from now on um, uh, I'm establishing the Catholic Church is the religion of this country because that would be illegal uh, and he's you know, he's subject to the law but it, there is a mechanism for altering the Constitution uh, and um, if it could be done without causing uh, more harm than good uh, which I presume would only be the case if there were a, a, a large uh majority of catholics who wanted it i mean i mean if, I mean, if there was a lot a majority of the population were catholics and they wanted it and there was not any other uh large minority religion who would um who who would consider it to be uh abominable uh but maybe, maybe there were just lots of small religions or lots of apathetic people then in those circumstances, it would be good to uh, to establish uh, the Catholic religion as the, the religion of the country. Uh, uh, and the same thing would apply on, on a state level. Perhaps that's a more realistic way to begin. If there was a given state where there was a, you know, a large majority of the people were Catholics uh, and there was no other significant minority religion, uh, then it could be legally and prudently made into a catholic state hmm. uh, but no, no that, that wouldn't mean um that you then uh, have to that you have got the right to suppress every other religion um uh but it would mean that certain things would, be, would become to be done for example you would start the civic important civic occasions with a high mass say well you know the president or the or the governor would would enter their term of office with celebration of a high mass would be prayers uh said at the on, on um you know before the beginning of a legislative session or maybe at the beginning of the uh, the court uh, the, the the court's day before uh business of hearing cases began uh the blessed trinity would be invoked um uh, the name of christ would be would be mentioned and so on um so that, that's one that's one answer to your question another way of answering your question though is um to say even without and before you formally establish uh, a realm or a, a province in a realm as catholic um you can recognize um the divine law as regards um certain moral uh some moral questions things which are um contrary to natural law uh and those who are well instructed catholics uh will be in a in a better position to know what is contrary to natural law and what is is not uh and they can they can certainly and we should use that knowledge to try to conform the laws of their country to natural law and the, the most obvious example of that today is abortion uh, so whether or not a country is officially catholic uh, it is right for those with uh, authority to do what they legally can within the existing uh, procedures of, of, of making laws to outlaw abortion uh, uh, and the same would apply to, to lots of other uh, violations of the natural law uh, so I, I would say for example of, um, uh, or euthanasia is an, is an obvious example uh, I would also say the production and, and um, sale of pornography or contraceptives would, uh, would, would be examples in, in general grave violations of the natural law 
which can be outlawed without causing greater problems uh, are things that that in all circumstances uh, legislators should be aiming to to achieve interesting so that that kind of makes me think i mean the basically saying be you make the most prudential steps to usher in a Catholic laws toward the end of performing a Catholic government, but that would be a small prudential steps, not necessarily having some kind of uh, overthrowing of the current government using the current structures of your government that you were in to bring about a more Catholic government or a Catholic government rather. Would that be correct? Yes. Yeah, so as we were talking about before, re revolution is not uh, is not legitimate. Uh, and just because you've got a good end in view, um, uh, the ends don't justify the means. So it's not um, uh, legitimate to uh, uh, overthrow your constitution by non-constitutional means just in order to uh, set up a, um, a Christendom. So you've got to you've got to follow the law. Uh, and but but even but even before you you've formally recognised the kingship of Christ, um, you are absolutely within your rights. Uh, so lawgivers are absolutely within, absolutely within their rights uh, to, for example, outlaw abortion, and that that's not uh, imposing my religion on other people. Uh, Partly because you know the wrongness of abortion is not just a revealed truth. Right. It's not something that you can only know about because God has revealed it. It's something you can know about by reason. Uh, and, and all those who are uh, living in society uh, um, ought to be living according to reason. Uh, and um, those those who are in positions of authority. And so a lot of people uh, are not, not violating anybody's conscience by by making sure that the, the requirements of reason are are upheld. Right. I think uh, the point about not violating people's conscience is important because, I mean, in one sense, I mean, we have the natural law and that's uh, knowable by all men. So those kind of things like banning abortion doesn't need to be a Catholic thing necessarily. It can just be a human thing. But the the question of the suppression of like freedom of religion for instance like that people whenever we uh, they hear integralism they're saying oh well that means they're going to start executing non-christians or non-catholics even you're going to be start burning books you're going to start all these different ideas come up what uh, w what truth is there in in some of it or what falsity is there in some of it i'm sure assuming that there are elements of truth and elements of falsehood uh in what is in that kind of assumption of what that would look like Yes, yeah, so I would say that there is a Catholic view, a Catholic doctrine of religious liberty, uh, and there's also a, a, a secular uh, doctrine of religious liberty. Um, so, um, so the various ways you might might approach this is a very complicated subject. It doesn't really lend itself to sound bites. Um, perhaps one way to approach it is to say that. It's part. It's always been part of the Christian teaching that, that no one may be brought to faith in Christ uh, by compulsion, by by threat of um, you know, temporal harm. By we, we can't convert people uh, by the sword, either literally or metaphorically. So we can't. Not only can we not um, uh, threaten to cut people's heads off if they don't get baptized, uh, but we can't you know, take away their property. If they don't won't get baptized uh, and we can't take away their existing uh, civil rights such as as the right to vote so I would say that's uh, that's part of the Catholic doctrine of religious liberty uh, uh, and so that includes uh, the rights of 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 monotheistic religions non-christian monothe monotheistic religions um, the pe people practicing those religions to have us have a certain freedom to practice those religions uh even in public even socially um so this is 
I would say this is part of the Catholic doctrine of religious liberty uh, as defined at the Second Vatican Council. Because if you don't, if you don't give them that freedom, then you are effectively coercing them towards baptism, which is, is a bad thing. But so that's that's the first half of the uh, equation. So the second half of the equation is, and this is where uh, the Catholic doctrine of religious liberty uh, disagrees with the, the modern liberal or uh, secular one, is it doesn't mean that we should treat all religions alike. Uh, so there's, there's a great phrase in in Pope Leo the Thirteenth, um, where he says it is contrary to reason the truth and error should have equal rights, and it's just one of those phrases that uh, it's hard to argue with. Um, of course, it's, it's contrary to reason that truth and error should have equal rights. Truth is one of the names of God. Um, so how does that how does that cohere with what I've just said about religious liberty? Well, um, one way in which it coheres is that Catholics have got the, the right and the, the duty to to evangelize others, um, uh, and, a, and a Catholic society will certainly recognize that. But others uh, don't have the right to try to tear Catholics away from the church. Hmm. Uh, uh, and that's something that a Catholic society will recognize, but only a Catholic society will recognize, because uh, unless, unless the society is officially Catholic and recognizes the truth of Catholic faith, it will say, well, religious, religion, we don't take a stance on it. No, it's just a free for all, free for all, may the best man win. Now, that, that will not be the view of a Catholic society. That will be uh, considered to be irresponsible. Uh, so to take a concrete example, I would say that in a Catholic society, um, Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons wouldn't have the right to go around knocking on doors in a Catholic neighborhood and say, did you know that the Pope is the, uh, the Antichrist and the Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon? Uh, this is why you should join us. Uh, it doesn't mean they'll be burnt at the stake. Uh, you know, we don't burn anyone at the stake, even for, for murder. Uh, but it does mean that they, they won't be allowed to do it. And if they try to do it that they will be punished in some way just as we punish you know, speeding offenses or people who stir up racial hatred awesome thank you very much father that being that that makes a lot of sense it's a good soundbite of a good kind of condensing of that kind of idea i'm sure like any number of the topics we discussed could be a whole lecture series on its own um, but definitely i think that was a good understanding i, I think uh, let me know if i'm understanding properly i'm going to try to summarize what you said the a by li religious liberty we don't mean that we have to uh oppress the non-catholics and force them to become catholic in fact that would be contrary to the teaching of the church but that also does not mean that the in, in a catholic view of religious liberty that every religion gets to have the same status uh in in the same in the country as another they can practice their religion without being um, physically oppressed or denigrated, or maybe not denigrated is not the right word, They without being oppressed physically but or, or governmentally, but they don't have any of the same, mm, they don't have the privileges of the true religion that, uh, and, and they will be refrained or restricted from trying to draw people out of the true religion. Is that a decent summarization? Or what am I getting right or what am I getting wrong? Yeah, that's that's pretty good. Um, so there, there is a distinction to draw. Um, and this, this is where things get um, more controversial, I could say, between uh, unbaptized people and baptized non-Catholics. So, mm -hmm. With unbaptized people, it's it's pretty clear um, that they've not um, they've not accepted the Christian religion, uh, and they can't be made to by by penalties by by taking away from them things that they prize, uh, unless those things are just against the natural law, like the right to abortion. Uh, but you can't take away their their money or their their voting rights or so on. 
Now, where things are, are more complex and more controversial is when it comes to uh, baptize people, uh, because uh, in so the, the church has the hierarchy of the church has an authority over Catholics, um, and in fact, it has an authority over all baptized people, even though today. Uh, in modern canon law, it doesn't use that authority over non-baptized people because there's no way to 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 do so. But in principle, uh, in a Catholic society, you could say, as as a way of um, uh, as a way of uh, causing Catholics to be or inducing Catholics to be faithful to their uh, to their obligations, uh, they've received. Uh, in baptism, you could penalise them in some way if they are not acting as good Catholics. So it would be within. So I'm not. I'm not recommending this as uh, as a manifesto policy. I'm just talking in the abstract about what is is lawful and just. Uh, you could say um, if a Catholic doesn't make his Easter duty, uh, doesn't go to confession and communion uh, in a given year, then his voting rights are suspended uh in that year uh, and that would be a way of um uh that would be a way of taking away something that he presumably values um in order to his spiritual good in order to induce him to fulfill what he's already obliged to do by baptism uh, uh, and again in principle um you could do the same to anyone who's baptized hmm. because they do come under the jurisdiction of the church. Uh, so that, that's obviously a, uh, not something that is uh, likely to happen in any, any scenario that we, that we're likely to, to see, but those, those things are within the, um, within the, um, uh, within the limits of, of what is just hmm. uh, and within the doctrine of Catholic religious liberty. Right. That makes a lot of sense, Father. I have, uh, you just opened a whole nother can of worms and we're just about out of time. I have about a dozen more questions that I'd like to ask you, especially regarding this particular issue. I, I'm just going to list a couple of things that I wanted to ask. That I'm not going to ask because I'll let you go in a second. I wanted to ask about rights and duties, about what, what do we mean when we say rights and what do we mean when we say duties? What are the relationship with one another uh, and to God? And the, the two swords doctrine of the church, uh, what is it and how, how the, I've heard from people, I took a, a, my bachelor's was in theology and in our ecclesiology class, I was told, you know, we used to believe in the two swords doctrine. We don't really believe in that anymore. Uh, but I, wanna, I won't get into that can of worms right now. Uh, the last question I have for you that I will ask you, and then we will close out. And I, I bring up all these to say, I, hopefully I can have you back in the future to explore maybe one or two of these topics more in depth and not have this overview where we talk about two dozen things with two minute sound bites. But, um, the last thing I want to ask is where does the supernatural element play in here? Uh, is I, I'm thinking of exactly uh, more more particularly, I'm thinking of the reign of Mary that people talk about, the prophecy of the great French monarch, the coming chastisement, these kind of things. So we're talking theoretical, then practical. Um, but what about these kind of things? Should we just not take these kind of private revelations into account? Um, but if you're convinced of them, what should we think about with these kind of ideas of the reign of Mary, the great French monarch, the great chastisement how, in relation to all the things we've been talking about? Yes, well, these various private revelations, um, to the extent that one that one does believe in them, I think they can certainly be encouragements to um, uh, to. The, the aim of of restoring Christendom in some form, uh, and they can uh, save us from just throwing up our hands in, in despair and saying, "Oh, it's all hopeless." Um, uh, and there's, there's a good example in the, in the life of um, uh, the Emperor Theodosius, who was the, in a way, the first emperor to establish uh, Christendom in the late fourth century, uh, who, when he was uh, having a life and death struggle against uh, um, another contender to the empire who was not Catholic, he he went to see a famous hermit in the desert, Saint John the Hermit, uh, who assured him that 
that God was with him and that he would triumph and, and so it came to pass. Uh, so I'm not sure that Theodosius actually uh, made any of his concrete uh, military decisions based on the, uh, the advice of the hermit. He, but I doubt the hermit was telling him where to you know, place his centurions or where to, to fight his next battle. Uh, but he certainly uh, was encouraged by the words of the hermit. And I think we can we can allow ourselves in the same way to be to be encouraged by, um, in particular, the uh, the words of Our Lady of Fatima uh, and the uh, the, the, um, the promise of, of a reign of the Immaculate Heart and of a period of peace, because you know, true peace means that things are well ordered uh, and things are only going to be well ordered when they're ordered towards our Lord as King. Awesome. Thank you very much, Father, for those uh, words of encouragement. And uh, that was another thing that I wanted to ask that I had written down. Uh, there was uh, the topic of peace, and because Thomas uses the word peace all over the place, and he's kind of doesn't define it too much. He defines it once at the beginning, and then kind of just like, okay, that's good enough, and he moves on with it. But I'll leave all that there for now. I promise you, we don't keep you for an hour. So uh, thank you, Father, for your time. Uh, if you would leave us with your with your priestly blessing, and be very grateful. Uh, yes, certainly. Benedictio Deo on the Patentis, Patris, Filiate Spiritus Sancti, Descendat Supervos, et Maria Semper. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father.